enormous expectations on the part of the Labour Party uh, that they will be significantly better treated and welcomed by uh, the EU because precisely they are not the Conservatives. Um, but the, the reality is that the European Union has very little interest in changing the current trade and cooperation agreement. The areas where uh, the UK has hopes of being able to uh, use leverage to achieve a better deal um, is defence and security. But there, the whole point of the European effort is uh, to increase strategic independence from the United States. Hello, I'm Brendan Donnelly. I'm the director of the Federal Trust, and I'll be talking today with the chair of the Federal Trust, John Stevens, about the course of the general election, the results, and particularly the implications of those results for relations between the United Kingdom and the European Union. John, there was a lot of comment um, about the absence of Brexit from the debate during the general election campaign. Um, do you agree with that commentary? And uh, if so, why do you think it happened or why didn't it happen? Well, it was certainly true that Brexit was the ghost at the feast. And it's hardly surprising, I suppose, because uh, the major parties didn't have any real interest to discuss it. Um, the Conservative Party, obviously, uh, because Brexit is now widely seen as having been a disaster, um, didn't want to go back over that territory. Uh, the Labour Party uh, felt that uh, the priority to win was to recapture the votes which it lost to Boris Johnson in 2019 in the so-called Red Wall. And the key to that was not talking about Brexit and certainly not suggesting in any way that they might seek to mitigate it or reverse it to any degree. Uh, and the Liberal Democrats um, were targeting initially their former heartland in the southwest of England, which was a leave area, overwhelmingly, in the 2016 referendum, and therefore felt that it wasn't in their political interests to talk about Brexit at all. And they'd also calculated that their target seats in the southeast of England, in the Blue Wall, where there were quite a number of Conservatives who voted Remain uh, in the referendum, um, that it was too complex a picture in terms of Conservative opinion, and that they were better off not going on a more pro-European message. Although the other overriding objection that they would have been inconsistent between the two was not actually a problem that has de detained the Liberal Democrats in the past. So th those are the main three three, three parties. Um, uh, a lot of surprise was caused by Starmer's remark at the end of the campaign that he couldn't imagine the United Kingdom rejoining the EU during his, his lifetime. Not clear whether it was his physical or political lifetime. Um, why, why do you think you, he said that? That, that seemed to mark a, a ramping up, um, perhaps an unnecessary ramping up of the position that he'd adopted until then. Well, I think it was due to a, a loss of nerve because his polling experts were telling him that the intervention by Nigel Farage and the increase in the profile of reform that that was cutting into the Labour vote. And there's no question that reform voters, um, reform after all came third in terms of the share of the vote in the general election, came uh, almost as much from um, the Labour Party, uh, Labour voters, as it came from Conservative ones. I mean, in a sense, Farage's intervention, um, his comeback and determination to be a candidate uh, did raise the profile of the Brexit issue because Farage is very much identified with that. Because the, the irony is that Farage himself didn't really want to talk about Brexit either uh, because it, it is widely perceived. I mean, nearly 70% of public opinion recognise that Brexit has been a mistake. Um, so he focused exclusively on immigration. So you had a situation where everybody effectively had a vested interest of one kind or another in evading the largest issue in British politics, namely our relationships with the European Union. Do you think that Starmer's remark uh, towards the end of the campaign 
it is going to affect in the short term the course of the development of EU-UK relations. How, how do you see those relations as working out over the next couple of years? Uh, will there, for instance, be frustration on the Labour side if they find that they're not going to get much in the way of purchase from simply not being the Conservative Party when they deal with the Commission and, and Council in Brussels? But it's certainly true there are enormous expectations on the part of the Labour Party. Uh, that they will be significantly better treated and welcomed by uh, the EU because precisely they are not the Conservatives. Um, but the, the reality is that the European Union has very little interest in changing the current trade and cooperation agreement. The areas where uh, the UK has hopes of being able to uh, use leverage to achieve a better deal um, is defense and security. But there, the whole point of the European effort is uh, to increase strategic independence from the United States and to build up their own uh, armaments industries uh, with European taxpayers' money. And the idea that Britain can present either an answer to the problem of the reliability of the United States as a, a strategic player in European defense um, I mean, Britain is seen to be, correctly, in my view, uh, essentially an adjunct of United States military power, if you look at the nuclear deterrent, but also if you look at our special forces and things. Um, and so it doesn't answer this, this question of a European uh, strategic independence from America. And then in, in terms of uh, Britain's um, hopes of, of having a whole range of side deals, um, on it, on free movement of students or whatever. Um, this is contrary to the, the EU's profound desire not to go down that path again. And you see that their the desire to avoid any form of uh, such arrangements in their current treatment of the, of the Swiss. So I, I, the, the, the hopes that the Labour Party have vis-a-vis -vis the European Union seem to be be based on, on two very fundamental misunderstandings of the European position. Will this even lead to friction in a couple of years' time? Well, I think it's quite likely that uh, having tried uh, on the basis that they're not the Conservative Party to be um, given a, a warm welcome and, and, and not receive one, there will be a certain amount of irritation and, and scepticism. But all this will be dominated by what happens in the United States. I think a Trump presidency will, will exacerbate all these problems because uh, there will be a suspicion that Britain will, whatever its misgivings may be about the Trump presidency and its implications for um, domestic democracy in America, um, that they will nevertheless go along with Trump. And, and uh, David Lammy was in Washington ahead of, um, before the, the general election and gave every indication that he was keen to talk with people close to Trump and work with Trump. The United, um, the United so, Kingdom might be seen as a Trojan horse, as somebody once said. Exactly. I mean, and this goes right back to the to the position that uh, Tony Blair took over Iraq and everything. So the, the, the European suspicions are, are, are very high. And the hurdle for the Labour Party to, to be able to overcome um, in, in order to uh, persuade the Europeans that, that they are really committed now towards getting closer to Europe, I think, are, are really beyond them. That's uh, the left of the British political spectrum, as it were. Um, how do you see the right um, uh, developing in the United Kingdom over the next couple of years? And obviously, attitudes to Europe will be central to and emblematic of that um, that internal um strife which we may reasonably expect within the Conservative Party? Well, here I think uh, the, the, the problem is again dominated by what happens in America, because I think a Trump presidency will vastly increase the power that Nigel Farage has because of his personal connections with uh, Trump and will colour uh, a large part of opinion on the, the right of British politics in 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 the Conservative Party, and will I think make it much more likely that he is able to achieve some form of takeover of the Conservative Party. Um, 
the now if that doesn't happen then i think the, the field may be somewhat more open because it is quite clear that a large body of conservative leading opinion there are very few politicians um who who would be able to address this audience but conservative leading opinion particularly in business is very keen for a reconnection with the European Union. Um, this is particularly true of, of manufacturing industries, but, but more generally, I would say. And they, at the moment, have no plausible political representation. I don't think it is credible for the Liberal Democrats to be able to fulfil that function and for there to be a split in the Conservative Party, therefore, with a, a large body of it going to reform and to Farage, and, but another body going into some form of pro-European centre-right connection with the Liberal Democrats, because the Liberal Democrats themselves are, in terms of policy, um, to the left of the Labour Party, but more that although they've achieved this astonishing score in terms of seats, um, their vote share um, is virtually unchanged. In fact, it's less than it was at the last general election. But, but so, quite, quite, quite a lot of people who voted Liberal Democrat were voting for a Labour government because they wanted to get out the Conservative in their particular constituency. That, again, is true. So um, I think the, the idea that, uh, which is certainly entertained by some um, pro-European Conservatives, most of whom are no longer in the Conservative Party now, that there might be some uh, basis of, of recreating a sort of orange book um, style um, link to the, the Liberal Democrats, um, as a response to reform and a way of uh, of uh, preserving a centre right pro European cause, I think is is probably misplaced at the moment. Uh, just to go back to the Labour Party, I mean, and talking about reform's impact on the Labour Party, um, I mean, one has to remember that reform has now got eighty seven seats in which it is in second place to the Labour Party, and I think that that is going to be a further restraint on the capacity for a Labour government to move in a more pro-European direction? Well, the, the counter-argument to that is that uh, economic um, circumstances and perhaps the development uh, in this country, in the United Kingdom, of even more hostility to Brexit um, in a couple of years' time will, will lead to a combination of, of forces um, that might oblige um, Starmer and the Labour Party to adopt a, a, a more... Uh, Eurocentric, uh, a more, more friendly attitude towards the European Union, because we've canvassed the possibility that disappointment uh, about the initial, probably rebuff or insufficient acceptance from from Brussels may lead to frictions with the Labour Party, but it could also lead to a, a reevaluation of, uh, of Starmer's red lines and the idea that you can't get too close to Europe. Do, do you see that as being a plausible possibility in a couple of years' time? I'm absolutely certain that uh, disenchantment with Brexit is only going to increase. And this full scale of uh, the disaster that it is bringing to uh, the British state and to the British economy and to British culture um, uh, becomes more and more apparent. And I think that there will be a very strong body of opinion, particularly associated with business, which will want to see the issue addressed. The problem is that it's not clear what the political voice for this a disenchantment and, and this pressure will be um, because it will be opening up divisions within the Labour Party. I said that the, the reform is a challenge to a section of the Labour Party's vote and Labour Party support. Um, but equally, there will be elements in the Labour Party which are very strongly pro-European. But whether they are able to uh, find a voice within the umbrella of, of the, the current uh, Labour government uh, is a very open question. And it's not clear where the voice will be um, on the other side, to the to the right of the spectrum, because of the problems which we've already uh, alluded to in turning the Liberal Democrats into anything other than what they are at the moment, which is a, a protest movement that has benefited from exceptional circumstances to win a large number of seats, but has not actually achieved a very large level of actual support in votes in, in, in the election. Can we talk a bit about the uh, implications of the election and particularly as related to Brexit uh, for the non-English parts of the United Kingdom, Scotland and Northern Ireland in particular? The, the Scottish National Party did, did very badly 
And there are those who draw the conclusion from that that um, independence um, is at best um, postponed for many, many years uh, and at worst or best, depending on your point of view, uh, off the agenda entirely. Um, what do you think about that analysis? Well, it was certainly a very serious defeat for the Scottish National Party. Uh, and the reasons for that are fairly clear. They've had two appalling leaders and their conduct of uh, government in Scotland uh, dealing with Scottish affairs has been pretty appalling. Um, but that has not actually altered the level of support in Scottish opinion um, for independence, which remains locked at about 50%, um, where it has been placed by Brexit having overturned uh, what would have been a uh, clear decision in 2014 um, in favour of retaining um, the United Kingdom. So independence remains an open issue. Now, it may well be if the political eclipse of the Scottish national cause in the form of the Scottish National Party continues, um, will the call for independence uh, fade or will it find some other outlets? And, and that, which is a rather alarming thought. Um, the, the, but for, the, for that issue, the crucial elections are not actually these ones in for Westminster. Um, they are the elections in, in two years' time uh, for the Scottish Parliament. And it remains to be seen whether this disaster for the SNP uh, leads them to change leaders again. I think it probably will. And whether they are able to then uh, re-establish themselves in order to make a credible showing in those elections. And um, that remains open. I think it, that the eclipse they, of the SNP has not led to any decline in anti-Brexit sentiment, has it, in Scotland? Well, quite the contrary, actually. I mean, one of the features of this campaign, I mean, Scotland was about the only place where Brexit was actually extensively discussed um, because it was something which the SNP were pointing out uh, um, on several occasions. Um, and support for rejoining the EU in Scotland is, is near 70%. And so it's a, it's a very strange situation. You have 30% support or perhaps less for the Scottish National Party. You have 50% um, support for independence and 70% for rejoining the EU. And it's not quite clear what the meaning of that is. What it does mean, I think, is that the Labour Party's victory in Scotland is a fragile one, because as long as that opinion towards the EU uh, remains intact, uh, Labour's, and, and Labour is on the present course of essentially being a pro-Brexit party, wanting to make Brexit work in the United Kingdom as a whole, then that is a, a very uh, clear path towards early disappointment by Scottish voters with the Labour Party. What about Northern Ireland? Do you think the situation has been much changed by the general election? Or has it just reflected changes that were already in, in, in place? Well, I think what has happened is that the unionist cause has fragmented We've seen uh, the DUP lose um, uh, to both an extreme uh, unionist, the TUV, and the defeat of uh, Ian Paisley Jr., um, and to the UUP, um, uh, who won a seat uh, from them. So that the that the, the 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 unionist political uh, family has been fragmented further, uh, and. The nationalist voters held up, so um, you you've had a um, a further lurch, I suppose, in a national direction, but one which is really predicated by the loss of credibility of political unionism, and that, of course, is a a, a danger because it potentially opens the path to uh, more extremist elements who are discontented with the um, arrangements of the. Um, uh, Trade and Cooperation Agreement and the Windsor Framework that's uh, attached to it, um, creating a border in the in, in the Irish Sea. Uh, but what will really determine um, the significance of that will be what happens in the Irish Republic in their elections, which are due in the autumn, and whether Sinn Féin uh, is able to be the largest party there and indeed form a government or not. And at the moment, that doesn't look so likely, but... Um, it's a very open situation. Were that to be the case, and, and you were to have 
questions of a border pole back on the issue, that would be a very difficult situation for uh, Keir Starmer and the Labour government because they will be torn between the requirements of peace in Northern Ireland, stability in Northern Ireland, um, and uh, trying to get closer to the EU. Um, and the EU will be not at all open to any form of further renegotiation of the Northern Irish arrangements. Yes, I'm going to, to add to that, that, that one of the reasons surely why unionism in, in Northern Ireland has lost in credibility uh, has been its support for Brexit uh, initially and um, and its um, hostility to the um, to the Northern Ireland Protocol, which which most people in Northern Ireland um, welcome as uh, as being a positive development. Well, absolutely. I mean, it is a, an astonishing example of a self-inflicted wound uh, yeah. by a political unionism to have supported Brexit. I mean, it, it has reopened uh, the whole issue of reunification, which uh, before the 2016 referendum was essentially a sleeping question yeah. uh, for the very long grass, uh, which is now um, up and centre uh, in the debate, not just in Northern Ireland, but also in the Republic. Quite a lot of what you've said, quite reasonably, this after today has been uh, uh, that it's too early to predict precisely the course of the Conservative Party, precisely the course of the Labour Party. But if you had to bet, do you think in 2029 uh, a Labour Party, presumably led again by Keir Starmer, um, is sitting down to um, draw up the European aspect of its manifesto. Um, will it still have the red lines that it has now? Will it have some new red lines? Or or, or will it, in, in general, over the course of the next four or five years, uh, evolve um, it, uh, away from these red lines, um, uh, more towards what the, um, the Conservatives and their supporters in the media say they fear, um, namely um, rejoining the European Union? I think rejoining the European Union will be a, an enormous issue at the next general election. I think British politics is far more fluid than uh, people appreciate. This election was, in many respects, a democratic a democratic disgrace. I mean, the, the low turnout, the capacity to form an, a government with an enormous majority on, on a very modest vote, uh, the distortions between the reform uh, seat score and the Liberal Democrat seat score and all the rest and the absence of any serious debate not just on Brexit and on Europe and European policy and our place in the world but on a whole range of other uh, domestic issues too there were no real solutions put to issues for the National Health Service or for public services more generally or for housing I mean it was an astonishing election actually a, a, a democratic disgrace and shows the fragility of British politics. And when you add to that the possibility with a Trump presidency, with all the challenges facing uh, Europe, the um, challenges of, of Russia and Ukraine, uh, the challenges of the uh, global economy and moves towards a greater protectionism everywhere, um, these are, are very turbulent times. We have the chance of seeing in particular uh, the British identity torn between an American option and a European one, the, the sort of debate that we have been trying to avoid for generations because of its potentially monumentally divisive nature. Uh, these are very, very dangerous times. And to predict precisely what the political uh, composition of the, and the forces will be in such circumstances, I think it is very difficult. This is we are in new territory here, really new territory. Well, we'll have a, a lot to talk about over the next four or five years. The, the only thing I would say in conclusion is that I'm quite confident if the British people are presented with a, a choice between crudely the American option and the European option, it's the European option they'll go for. Um, and that's the reason why the people who were in favour of Singapore on Thames or Dallas on Thames kept so quiet about what they wanted during the um, referendum, because they knew it was something that was politically unsaleable to the British electorate. But thank you very much indeed, John. Um, there's a, a lot of other similar material on the Federal Trust website. Um, and thank you very much for joining us today. Mm -hmm.